Cool. Well, welcome again to the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And today we have a glorious collection of bits and pieces, specifically noting the Nobel Prize, because that's what's came out this week. So we're going to start off by jumping straight in, listing the Nobel laureates as they are. So 2011 Nobel Prizes in literature was given to Thomas Tanstroma for his, uh, his wonderful poetry, quote unquote, through his condensed translucent images, he gives us free access to reality, which is a rather funky way of saying that he's really good at writing. <laughs> In chemistry, uh, it was given to Dan Shetman for the discovery of quasi-crystals, and there's a really interesting story behind that as well, um, because he was thought to be completely insane when that came out. Gosh. We'll come back to that later. In physics, yay! Uh, Nobel Prize in Physics for 2011 went to uh, Saul Perlmutter and Brian P. Schmidt and Adam G. Rice for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observe, observing distant supernova, which is a very, very cool a uh, very, very cool achievement, which totally revolutionized our understanding of reality. And finally, the big one. I hate to admit it, but this is probably the most important of all of them. Nobel Peace Prize for 2011 went to three women, two from uh, Liberia and one from Yemen, for their work on uh, women's rights, quote-unquote, non-violent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace-building work. So congratulations to them. Absolutely. Very well deserved. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always so interesting to see um, what the prizes are are each year. Uh, and, and staying with the Nobel-themed uh, things, um, an article on how uh, two Nobel Prize um, medals in physics were hidden from the Nazis during the occupation of Copenhagen. Um, what, what happened was that uh, the Nazis had said that no gold was allowed to leave Germany. And what two Nobel uh, Prize winners had done was, was quietly send their medals to Niels Bohr's Institute in Copenhagen for safekeeping. Now, of course, that's treason. If they'd been caught or if the medals had been found, there would have been severe problems, especially because, of course, people's names are on the medal, so you can tell where they came from. Um, so, <clears throat> expecting the Nazis to come through the doors at any moment, uh, suddenly Niels Bohr and another chemist, Hevesy, uh, George, Georgie de Hevesy, in fact, sort of thought, well, how are we going to get rid of these medals? We can't bury them because uh, you know, the grounds will just be dug up and, and they will be found. And and gold is pretty stable, so it doesn't tarnish, it doesn't rust. It's it's actually really difficult. You can't just dissolve it. You can't really get rid of it easily at all, except for there's one particular chemical emulsifier called aqua regia, which is a mixture of three parts hydrochloric acid and one part nitric acid, which is able to dissolve gold. So they basically dissolved these two metals into a solution. Uh, by the time the Nazis came, there was just a, a flask containing a sort of an amber-colored liquid. Uh, it was left on the shelves completely undisturbed for several years. Uh, Hevesy had to flee the country for a while, and when he came back, the flask was still there. He was actually able to precipitate the gold back out of solution um, and have the metals recast. Awesome. <laughs> Gotta love the ingenuity to get around the Nazis there. Absolutely brilliant stuff, yeah. Just goes to show that they fully deserved the prizes as well. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> a little bit closer to home now, our kind of version of yearly Nobels. Uh, the Marsden Grant have just come out, and New Zealand researchers have been awarded $53.8 million worth of funding to research all kinds of weird and wacky things. So the pick of them that the Royal Society pulls out are questions like, are the fossils found in New Zealand the direct ancestors of our our distinctive modern flora and fauna? Did Moriori settle the Chatham Islands directly from East Polynesia, or did they come past New Zealand? And, unsurprisingly, what are the mechanisms and conditions under Earth's crust that cause big earthquakes? <laughs> it's kind of easy to see why that one got um, funded, I guess. Yeah. So Marsden's a really, really cool fund that promotes excellence in research throughout the country. It's absolutely crucial to researchers of all um, different stages in their career, but unfortunately it has a really, really low success rate. It's extremely competitive. They got uh, 1,078 preliminary proposals this year. 250 of those only were asked to submit a full proposal, and only 88 were ultimately funded. And this is actually the lowest success rate ever in the Marsden Fund scheme. It's 8.2%. Wow. But that gives you lots of money for three years. So mm. <laughs> You take the good with the bad. But again, congratulations on everyone who uh, did manage to get a Marsden grant. Moving on to to something probably a, a little less prizey, shall we say. Uh, and in fact, this is two brief pieces. The first is a website called Nice Figure, <laughs> which is great. And it has absolutely nothing to do with how you might look in your swimming cozy this summer. Oh. It's uh, a website devoted to um, a roundup of the nicest figures recently published in scientific journals. So 
uh, sometimes it's actually sort of infographics and, and serious data visualization. Sometimes it's just really, really well done graphs or, or, or a visualization of the data. It's worth having a look at, particularly if you're involved in writing papers, uh, to see how it can be well done <laughs> as opposed to poorly done. Um, yeah, and the second one, uh, which is also sort of visually based, is called Mapper. And uh, it's at getmapper.com. And you can help NASA find life on Mars by exploring the lakes of British Columbia. Basically, they've taken a whole bunch of images of the bottom of the lakes in British Columbia. And you can go through and tag all these images. You can get points and all kinds of things. And the idea is basically um, it's looking at some of the formations made by bacteria with the idea being that if they can get this done and get it all properly tagged, it'll help them uh, when they're looking at huge numbers of photos of Mars to be able to make uh, some of the comparisons necessary. So great, good fun. You can sign up. It's free. Uh, I've, I've already done some. <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely interface as well. Cool. The next article is from Nature this week, um, and it's not a scientific one. For It's an opinion piece, and it caught my eye because it's an, uh, a topic which is very, very close to home. It was written by a PhD student called Lydia Murray, and she explains that while running through the first year of her PhD, it's a bit like an emotional minefield. Um, you have your highs, you have your lows, and she says that one of the things you have to learn in the first year of your PhD is how to cope with constant failure, yeah. um, repeated failure again and again and again and scientists just kind of professional scientists they've grown up with it they kind of live with it and shrug it off but she's saying that it's really important for all scientists to have a mechanism of dealing with um, their stress as they grow the really really thick skin you need for the job she it's a really really well written article really nice and short and it has some uh, shall we say colourful descriptions of how she'd like to treat people um, <laughs> in illegal ways who don't quite <laughs> who don't quite cotton on to how difficult and challenging this can actually be but really really cool article well worth a look mm, sounds fascinating uh, I will look forward to reading that a little later right the next one again is, is two sort of short pieces the first is about the Taurus G4 now the Cafe Foundation which is uh, an organization of people devoted to um, researching personal aircraft basically they run a, a a competition every year looking at uh, called the Green Flight Challenge. Now this year uh, NASA and Google were behind it. And the uh, big winner, the, the, the sort of the top ranking plane, which was given $1.35 million um, by NASA, which is apparently the biggest prize in aviation history, is this Taurus G4 which flew 200 miles in two hours. It's completely electric. Now, apparently, even two years ago, that was the stuff of science fiction, uh, and and no longer. And it's a fascinating design. It's actually, um, if you have a look at it, it's got a twin fuselage, which basically means you've got two cockpits either side of a large central propeller. So it's built very, very differently. But uh, yeah, it's just great to see that people are doing this and, oh, wow. and that electric. Uh, or, or green aviation is indeed possible. I'm imagining something like Sky Captain in the world of tomorrow. I'm it's, definitely going to have to have a look. Yeah, it looks something like that. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Speaking of weird, cool things that are somewhat the realm of science fiction, the next article is, is actually a video we stumbled across uh, hmm. throughout this week. It's called The Beginning of Infinity, and it's posted on Vimeo by a guy called Jason Silver. Now, a little, uh, a little bit of digging brought out some interesting information about him. <laughs> He's a transhumanist. And I'll let Amy explain what that is. Right. So transhumanists are basically, um, if you've ever heard of Ray Kurzweil and the singularity, he's probably one of the more famous transhumanists out there. Uh, transhumans defined as, well, it's an international intellectual and cultural movement um, that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging um, and to also greatly enhance human, uh, you know, intellectual and physical and psychological capabilities. Capabilities. I, I myself am a transhumanist, in fact. Um, basically, the, the idea is that with technology, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the horrors of the human condition can eventually be overcome. And, and, and so transhumanists tend to be quite sort of technologically positive, although, of course, um, one does have to look at the negative potential effects of, of technology as well and sort of think how to, how to overcome them or avoid them. So, yes, that's, that's Jason. 
that's who he is. But he's made this video. Oh. And this video discusses some really interesting points. I think everyone should watch it and at least have a think about these mm. things because they, they really get your creative juices flowing. He starts off by stating that the role of the human imagination is to conceive of all the possible delightful futures and to choose the most amazing, exciting, and ecstatic ones and to pull our present forward to meet it. And he then goes on to describe what he thinks the ultimate consequence of this will be, which will be the entire universe subjected to the sculpting of consciousness, of minds, which is an idea I'm not sure if I'm very comfortable with, but I certainly like thinking about it, and it's really, really worth uh, worth taking a look at. Mm. It's only about a minute and a bit long, so... Absolutely. He draws the uh, the analogy of, of Manhattan no longer being defined by its geology, but being defined by economics and, and cultural... Uh, well culture in general and and basically by the human mind by our creativity and then sort of extends that out to say well you know if that can happen to a city why can't it happen to the entire universe maybe gravity for example is is only a major effect uh in the universe in its very early days before mind becomes a significant force so yeah have a, have a look uh silver has also done um a couple of interesting documentaries as well on sort of futurism and transhumanism and whatnot they're worth they're worth uh, keeping an eye out for and maybe watching I guess you could say we've already made serious inroads into competing with gravity on a um, kind of solar system scale as well. So, yeah, Indeed. really interesting, that chain of thought. <laughs>